Here I go, here I go, here I go. Yeah, here I go, here I go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of The Take. I'm your host, Jackson Burleson, of course. In today's episode, I got a special guest, linebacker for Gardner Webb, and also he graduated from my high school. It's good to see you. Quentin Cannon is joining us on The Take. Appreciate you hopping on. Yes, sir. Appreciate you for having me. I'm excited. No problem, bro. So this is the take podcast. So we're going to start out with some takes real quick. So this is a little segment I like to call JB's picks. Okay. I'm getting my odds from, from hard art bags. You don't, we're not doing, you're not doing any odds. So we're good, but there's a couple games, big games this weekend. What's one game that you're looking at and who's your winner for it? So, uh, as you know, you and me both from Indiana, so I'm going to have to go with the Indiana-Ohio State game. Uh, of course, I'm going to have to rock out with my boys at home, so I'm going to choose Indiana to win that game. they on, like, a good little streak, and it'll be, like, a really good upset. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to watch it because I'm going to be playing at that time, but that's a game I'm really excited to see the outcome of. Yeah, I'm a, that's a that's a big one. We're, we're going to get into that more in depth later in this episode. But that's a so you're going to the Indiana Hoosiers. OK, OK, that'll be an interesting topic. When we get to it, but I'm going uh, plus 11 Florida. Uh, they're playing hey. Ole Miss at home and they beat LSU last week. I mean, I was very impressed. Florida was four and five. They needed to win that game to be even bowl eligible. So I'm like, OK, let's see. And you see the floor state behind me. So I don't like Florida, but. I'm not picking them to win, but I think they can at least make it a close game in the swamp. It's one of the best environments in college football. I mean, that play, bro, that place is just rumbling every time I watch it. Every time. I love that stadium. I love that stadium. Bro, if you had to play, play in some big stadium. What's the best, like, what's the best environment you've ever played in in your career? So, I'm going to go back to 2021, my first ever college football game. It was right after COVID. So, as you know, you and me both started college in 2020, and there was no fans allowed. So, 2021 was the first real season, and I got the opportunity to literally get in the game and play against Michigan when they had uh, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, Blake Corum, J.J. McCarthy. So, like, literally from going from zero fans to 100, 100 and like 5,000, like, for my very first game and I actually was on the field playing, it was just, like, a surreal experience. Like, I just couldn't believe, like, I was literally looking around the whole stadium just screaming and nobody could hear you. Jeez, so, dude. I'll never forget that. What was it I'll like seeing forget. that offense? Because they won a national title, of course. What was it like seeing that offense up that close? So, like the offense is just really explosive. Um, they had a really good receiving, as you know. Like Blake Corum was like extremely good. Like obviously coming out of high school, I haven't played a back of that caliber ever. So just seeing how he was able to move, and then the strength, and then the size of their O line. Like they had so many packages where they have like two extra O linemen and or one extra O linemen, and just really trying to get their run game started and. Um, Towards the end of the game, J.J. McCarthy ended up getting subbed in. I just started – I seen, like, one of the most ridiculous plays ever. Like, he stood thorn one of our linebackers, ran to their sideline and literally threw a rope all the way across to our sideline, about 40 yards, just a dot. Like, so just seeing that in person, this is real college football. Like, no joke. Jeez, bro. That's nuts, dude. Yeah. Cause you were, cause you had to, cause you're a linebacker, so you got to at least play the run a little bit. Did yeah. you ever get a chance to tackle when Blake uh, Corum? So, so that game, uh, I was really majority on special teams because I was technically like a freshman, so um, I was really in a lot during kickoff and kick return and um, a lot of punt. So I didn't get the opportunity to tackle uh, Blake Corum, but I did get an uh, opportunity to make get in on some plays on kickoff and make some tackles. I can't really remember who I tackled. I know it wasn't Blake Corum for sure, though. But <laughs> I was just really witnessing, like, them. Our, our team was pretty good. So it's not like we got blown out or anything. But it was it was just impressive seeing that team and how they worked versus um, a group or five school, which I was at at the time. So 
but Jeez. I got the opportunity to play in a lot of big stadiums. That's cool, bro. That, I'm like, just, I'm like trying to envision that because the the rush you probably get when you're running out of the tunnel is exactly. gotta be insane, right? It was insane. And so, um, like literally, when I went off on the opening kick return, I just literally am standing in the middle of the field, and it's so loud. Like I'm literally like. No, but like I'm literally screaming at the top of my lungs and none of my teammates can even hear me. I don't think anybody noticed and I'm screaming. But it's just so loud. You can't even hear yourself scream. Like you and me could be side by side and it would be so hard to have a conversation. Dude, that like so how do you just, you can't communicate? Like how do you communicate as a can't. defense? Like you just gotta get everything, either hand signals or just be as loud as you can and just make sure your brother next to you just echoes everything like that's really what you have to do in a lot of these big games and um last year I played in a huge game I played against Iowa where I was in at Sam linebacker so I got some real experience at linebacker playing against Iowa which is almost like the same type of crowd as Michigan yeah. and um I just I just love those type of games because it just feels like you on a video game like literally feels <laughs> yeah. like you're in a video game like playing these big schools um, I just remember I was playing outside leverage coverage on the slot receiver. Um, just just one-on-one, like no help at all. So oh, it's just crazy, like just locking in. And it's really like once you're out there, you don't hear the crowd at all. Like you really just so locked in onto your assignment that everything just gets blurred out. Like you're so immersed in the moment. Yeah, that I feel like, yeah, people will probably talk about it being hard to tune that stuff out. But I mean, football is not like – other sports where the fans are like really close, like the side, there's like a gap, a decent gap between the crowd and the sidelines usually. So that's not like, too bad. Well, right. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of games I play where the sideline, obviously once you're on the field, you're not affected by the peep crowd, but once you go to your sideline, like you do get a lot of heckling. It depends, <laughs> depends on what teams you play. Like my right, our rival central Michigan uh, last year, um, they were literally pelting us with snowballs during the game. Oh, ice, shoot. Like, like, literally, like, they had to call the police. So no it was way. extremely crazy. We ended up uh, beating them on their home field. But it was just a crazy experience seeing, like, my D coordinator get hit right in the chest by a snowball. Like, Dude, and I'm getting serious? hit in my rib. I'm trying to figure out what's hitting me. And uh, <laughs> we figure out it's the crowd. So. They definitely do play a part, but I do enjoy all that too. Like, oh my! It just gosh. fires you up. It, it just gives you even more reason to play. So, Getting hit with a snowball. Played in some pretty big games. Yeah, it was. It was. I've never experienced something like that. I also, yeah. got to play in a, uh, some upsets too. So, jeez, bro. Up, snowball. Up, I don't think I've heard that one before. That's the first like I've that. heard that. It was, they was just pelting us with snowballs. Like, I'm like how is it allowed? Like. Where the police at, bro? All those fans. I mean, the the problem is there's probably too many fans throwing them, so like they don't know who to yeah, kick out. Probably. Yeah, they couldn't pinpoint who it was. <laughs> and I, know they <laughs> oh, I just my. could not believe that. Jeez, dude, that is insane. Mm. What the heck is wrong with people, bro? <laughs> like, no, people are crazy. Luckily, like, you got helmets on, so you can't. It's, exactly. It just doesn't even phase you. Well, I got hit literally in my rib, so I'm like, it didn't hurt, but like you could feel it, bro. I'm like, oh my goodness, like what was that? Like I'm just getting angry, like looking. And around. someone's really got to throw yeah, it far to from the together. stands. I mean, that's not that's a pretty oh, far yeah. distance, <laughs> and you got to be accurate to too. Go super far. So. <laughs> exactly. Get one of those fans to play quarterback if they can like, do that. So <laughs> no, for real. Like you might as well get out here on the field. Right. But it's just it's just I just love it though at the end of the day. And there's just memories like you can't ever forget, like I'm telling you. So Jeez. I got to play in a bunch of big games, upsets. We That's ended up so beating cool. Pitt while I was there at Western Michigan. Oh wow. But I got to play against Jordan uh Jordan Addison and Kenny Pickett. And I'm really? a Steelers fan myself, so playing in that oh. Steelers Stadium was just surreal and then even getting a win on the field too. Like and we it was probably like it was forty five to forty two. We ended up winning the game against Pitt, and just seeing Kenny Pickett and Jordan Addison was just like one of the craziest experiences I've ever like ever seen. Like it was just such a fun game. Jeez, that's that, yeah. I mean, it's good to get experiences like that. And when you exactly. see college football, you see the evolution. You see it's changing. Mm -hmm. 
We were going this year, 12 team playoff, which has been an absolute like mess in my opinion. I, I, we'll get into my opinion a little bit, but what is your opinion on the college football playoff? Cause I have a lot to say. I just want to hear what you have to say first. Uh, so my personal opinion, I just think it's, uh, I think it's extremely interesting. Now I don't know how safe it will be on like players' bodies is, I think it might be a little bit more game, so uh, it could increase the amount of injury for certain teams. But I do like the opportunity it gives for teams like Boise State um, or, or just teams like in smaller like conferences to get the opportunity to prove themselves because, you know, most of the teams might be ranked 12 or 11 or 10, so they might not ever see the, the playoffs if it would have stayed how it was. So I just like the new opportunity teams get to – prove they self and in the college football players because as you know like anything can happen right really like anything can happen so I, I really like it a lot i'm just gonna see how it goes this year just like you i i mean i like it but there's problems with it because the the one issue to me is like uh, you see this florida state flag behind me mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna bring them up because they're they're going the four best teams when they've had the four you know, team college football playoff, four best teams get in. This year, that's 12 best teams. That's not the case. And the and the standings are weird too. Like with the conference buys, like right now, SMU is the best, they have the best ACC record, but Miami's ahead of them because of the highest ranked ACC team. But it should be who has the best conference record, not who's the best mm -hmm. like team per se, like the ranked team or whatever. And then all the, the buys, I mean, I get it. It's It helps, like, get an automatic bid, kind of like March Madness. But when you've got Boise State, who's, like, ranked 12, and then getting a fourth seed buy over, like, teams like Alabama, Georgia, like, all these SEC teams who are beating each other up. And a lot of these SEC teams had two losses because there's all the good exactly. teams in the college football are playing against each other. So it's kind of hard to, like, really make a judgment and then you've got number one Oregon which mm -hmm. I haven't really been too impressed with them I mean they're 11 and 0 but like they're just barely winning some of these games that they should be absolutely dominating I mean, last exactly. week and they barely beat Wisconsin so I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of problems I think it should be the 12 best and I'm sure there's a okay. mid-major I can get in there now but they, it, they have to fix it a little bit in my opinion yeah I definitely agree with you uh but like you said, it's just kind of hard to find a fine line. Like you said, Boise State has been so impressive. But when you compare them to some of those SEC schools, it's like, yeah, they, they'd they be undefeated too if they was – or they at least have one loss if they was in Boise State's conference. So it is kind of hard to rank those teams when they all play in each other and they're all so talented. Yeah. So, that, that's not – If there's any real reason to rank it. I mean, it's 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 hard because like I want to see those underdog teams in there. Like I, I like like you know the UCFs of the past, like them going undefeated, not getting an opportunity. I mean, I feel like all these teams do get an opportunity, but it's like mm -hmm. at a certain point, I feel like everything that the committee has said in the past about the playoff, like the four best teams, feels like it's kind of contradicting itself this year a little bit. Exactly. That's how I feel about the feel about like it is kind of contradicting. And like you said, you seen what happened with Florida State last year. So it's just I feel like this year is gonna be a learning experience for all of NCAA football. And I really as long as it's still entertaining though. Like, oh, it's gonna be entertaining. Just, yeah, I mean yeah, it will be. It's gonna be interesting game. picking these. But the problem yeah. is like if you're it, yeah. and then like a team like Indiana who's had a great season. But I mean, they've had the 106th like ranked schedule, strength of schedule. They haven't played anybody, and they're ranked fifth. Like that was no, the knock on Florida yeah. State last year. They but didn't play anybody. Away, I mean, exactly. you can't, but can you? Yeah, that's true too. But this like, week well, they are going to prove it. This week, exactly. this week. So, but even if they lose, what do you think going to happen? Because you can't bump them out of the top ten. It, the only way. I think they get bumped out is if it's not competitive. If Ohio State just blows them out by like 30, if it's not a close game. But if IU loses by like three or like seven, I mean, I could definitely, they're going to get in. I mean, right now they have a 97% chance to get in where they currently are. 
So this is a big yeah. game, which we'll we'll get let's let's go into this one because I first of all, who would have thought that the Indiana Hoosiers would be a top five team in the country? I mean, I never saw I did not see that coming. Like what has impressed you the most like about this team? Happy, like, well, I played against a quarterback last year on a Mac because he came from Ohio. So when I was playing against him, I was blitzing him a lot. I was seeing him make a lot of good throws under pressure. And once I found out he was going to IU, um, I kind of knew they was going to be in some good hands because he just see, it seemed like a seasoned veteran quarterback. Um, I know their head coach had a lot of winning at his old school. So I just, I was just, it did shock me that they undefeated right now. But I'm not surprised that they're good. Like they've always had the talent. It is really just putting all those pieces together, and it's just really interesting how they've grown the fan base. Like, like you and me both have never really seen IU Stadium jam packed. No, I mean there were fifty three thousand people program. at the arena or at the stadium exactly. for the game against Michigan. I mean that what is it like? I can, they've had consecutive sellouts, multiple weeks. And that's was really impressive. Like, oh my gosh. I mean, that is I'm a just happy for them guys out there. I mean, I never saw I didn't think it was even possible for yeah, IU to be good at football. <laughs> but no, it's it's a cool well, story. So. And the coaches came in and changed exactly. the culture. Like he he's and he got a new contract coach. extension too. So I mean that's that's no, it's I'll good to see. Gave him extension. <sighs> yeah, he got he got a lot of money there. <laughs> yeah. But do it. So I, they just keep proving everybody wrong. Can they, like you said, they can go into Columbus and win. What's it going to take oh, for them to I get it done? They're going to Columbus. I forgot they're going to Columbus. Well, I just think if they play good defensively, and um, if I really just, if they eliminate like explosive plays, I think that's where uh, they'll really succeed. This is really those explosives. Like, you know, um, Jeremiah Smith, like a real explosive player. Yeah. Like, they able to contain players like him, and I know the rest of the receiving core. I think they'll do do pretty good. Yeah, and Buka is in there to. too. He's really good. They've got great yeah. running backs to Shavion yeah. Henderson and Quinshawn mm-hmm. Juckins. and then of course you got a Chip Kelly ran offense yep. with Will Howard. That's gonna be interesting to see. Yeah, so they got to test Will Howard this game. Really, really put some pressure on him, make him uh, make some hard throws because at the end of the day, like. They're gonna to have to get turnovers to win this game. Uh, even though the offense is good for IU, uh, they just gonna to have to make some make some explosive plays and kind of turn the table to make this upset. As you know, like the best play is gonna win the game. And they did it in against Michigan. I mean, they had a couple forced fumbles, and they're getting to the quarterback. They're making him uncomfortable. They play tight coverage. I mean, you've seen it with this defense since you're a defensive guy. What are some things that have stood out about just what they've been doing all year? Uh, last game, I just – I really like how uh, they've been sending them a lot of pressure, um, just making the plays when they come to them. Like, that's that's the most important things. And then I just really like that um, the defense and the team collectively, like, wins the games they're supposed to. Like, they're not trying to play around with uh, certain teams that they know they should be. Like, they're really trying to go out there and dominate. So – like you say, you can see the coaching influence. You can see how they're they're coached differently, and the mentality is different to where, like, they're confident in they sell, um, they're confident in their team, and they know what they can do, and they know that they can really execute and win these games in big moments, and you know, just dominate. Like, that's really all it is. I'm just really happy and impressive, and that's really my one take from watching them play. Yeah, and especially against Michigan, I mean. They don't have the players they had last year for sure, but they still have a pedigree of winning and coming out there and putting their best foot forward. And it was a close yeah. game. It was a battle. I mean, they only won by five, but I feel like, you know, because he, because they had an interception in their own territory. There, there's a couple mistakes that they made that that can't happen against a team like Ohio State. Because I mean, Ohio State, they're literally the number one team. And points no allowed. They they don't give up many points on defense. The only t- yeah. they've only had one game, bro, where they've allowed literally literally only one game with thirty points on them, and it was against Oregon. Every other game, they've been really yeah. strapping up. Yeah. Even against Penn State, that was number four in the country, 
They only allowed 13 against them. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying where it has to come in, where IU has to not shoot themselves in the foot, but they also going to have to play a lot of field position. Um, it's going to take a lot of coaching, and it really is going to have to come down to turnovers and how they control the field. Because, as you know, like you can win some of these games with good defense and field goals and points when you when you, when you got to capitalize on points, you got to score the ball. So, like you said, the defense is going to be really hard to score against, but if they control the field and they stay on the Ohio State side, then I really think that they can make something happen because you have some explosive receivers just like Ohio State. So it's really the field position battle and which offense is going to be more explosive. I mean, there's a couple guys. I mean, Elijah Sarah has really kind of had a great season. I, I've really liked his game a lot. And then okay. Justice Ellison's been really good. I mean, they have a lot of good players on offense. I mean, they have the guys that can get the ball in space. It's just, it, it's just so funny because when I'm when I was making this podcast and I was like, okay, what should we talk about? And I'm like, Indiana football. I'm like, I mean, yeah, I still can't even believe it. Like, we just had a whole guy. Like, I still can't. I'm sitting here right now. And I still can't believe it. Like, it's so cool. It's so cool. Like. Just crazy how you can flip a culture in a program that fast. So that's you, how long do you think he'll coach. stay as the coach in Indiana? I think he'll at least stay for like three or four years. Like, there's really no reason for him to leave. Like, he can really build a legacy there. He just build up that program. Like, like you said, like they're top ten. Like, there's no reason to really leave now. So, top five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's top that's five. just like so insane. Like to, that you even saying like top five is just like. So impressive, like win, lose, or draw. That coach has kind of stamped the culture for the for the program for probably the next five years or until he's done. And I don't know if you, I, I'm sure you probably were aware of this, but I don't know if you knew. Ohio State has beaten Indiana 29 straight times. 29 straight? 29. Yeah, I did not know that. I'm not I, surprised, but that's insane. Like, I, it, this is probably the best Indiana team to ever break that streak, though. I mean, it's not even close. I mean, I think this is the best IU football team in program history right now. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, there's no argument to even say that. Like, they're top five, like you said, like, especially in the college football era now where there's so many different type of offenses. There's elite defenses. You're playing against guys with NIL. Um, you're playing against uh, just, just top-tier, like, players. Like, I feel like – College football has been leveled out from every from all the conferences. Uh, even at my school, we played JMU and then we played Charlotte, and we ended up losing to JMU by six points, and then we lost to Charlotte by like two points. So, yeah. as an FCS program playing a big group of five, two big group of five um, FBS programs, you can see like on all levels the skill gap is narrowing, and this is becoming even more competitive. So. Yeah, I saw you guys really play James Madison too. I also yeah. saw you guys play Charleston Southern, which my my Florida State Seminoles play this Saturday. I, I want oh, yeah, to ask you. Definitely dominate. We, we should. We've you've yeah, seen the struggles it. that we've had this year. I mean, uh -huh. how how crazy has it been to see Florida State go from undefeated to only winning one game to this point right now? And it's kind of shocking because I had a close teammate. I was real close with him at Western Michigan. He ended up transferring to Florida State. His name Braden Fisk. Uh, he plays for the um, Rams right now. So I was mm -hmm. really tuned in to Florida State last year just watching him play. I don't know if you uh, remember him or not. but I do. I uh, do, yes. A just, beast. <laughs> yeah, he, gave, he gave a lot of effort, yeah. Straight beast. And he was like, just like that at Western Michigan, too, just – set the tone for effort, just getting in the backfield as much as he can. And there's no surprise he's doing that in the NFL. So um, just kind of watching Florida State go from undefeated, like you said, I just really think it hurt them losing Jordan Travis. As I feel like he was the real heart of the offense. And especially with them having Keon Coleman, too, it was just – they were really entertaining to watch. Yeah. So yeah I feel a... like they're going to be back So uh, It's hard because right now we have – Zero wide receivers on the recruiting class exactly. for Florida State. None. And then we had a a four star quarterback who was committed to us flip to Florida. So I don't know. It feels like it's just falling apart. Florida. 
Hey, but Florida State is still a historic program, so it might not it might not be as good right now, but it'll only be a matter of time before they write back in the element. So they just got to put a lot of pieces together, uh, hire the right guys around, and, and do the best they can recruiting wise. But like you said, it's gonna be kind of hard. Like when you got schools like Michigan and Miami, you know, oh, well, you know, Miami's doing really well, but. It's kind of hard to compete with Florida too. So. And there's also new teams coming up in the ACC, like SMU. They're really good. Exactly. Clemson's still really good. I, I think the problem with Florida State was like the, they invested like their whole team is transfers, and you mm -hmm. like it's kind of hard when you don't have a lot of guys that are familiar with each other's games and styles. I feel like exactly. And that's kind of what my team was dealing with this year. We got a brand new head coach and literally just pulling guys from being all over the country to kind of mesh together. So the talent's there, but when it comes down to those close games and uh, those games you should win, it makes it a lot harder when you have a lot of guys who haven't gelled together compared to guys who've been together three, four years in a row. Yeah, your program uh, had the sixth most transfers in the F FCS. I didn't know that. Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah. I was like, so what? We actually set the FCS record for sacks too last week. So really? It's like the talent right, there, but just meshing everybody together. Like you said, it's hard pulling people from the transfer portal and trying to have that quick one year of success. So, just what's your take know. on the transfer portal? How do you think it affects college football in a negative or positive way? I think um, in a negative way, I say from my experience, like when I was at Western Michigan, it was kind of like I was a very talented player. I, I played all three linebacker spots over the course of my years there. But um, my coaches have trusted me. Uh, they threw me in a couple games. But it was kind of hard because a lot of times I was behind older guys so much because, as you know, like the portal, you can just keep grabbing guys out every year after year, just bring in an older guy or veteran after veteran. So um, instead of sticking with, you know, younger players that might have a lot of talent and developed in them. They uh sometimes coaches bring in older guys that aren't at or might be at the peak, but you might have a younger guy that his peak could be higher than a veteran's peak if you just develop them. And it might take a, a down season or um a losing season, but when it comes together in two years or three years when you know younger guys become veterans, like you said, they have this chemistry. That was where you see the the best teams because they have a real good connection. They built they all bought into the culture of the program. So it's a pros and cons to the portal. I do like that um, transfer portal does give athletes opportunities just get a fresh start in places and just um, it's not always the case like where it's negative like a lot of these players might not uh, do good with coaching so. They might just need a new fresh start. And you see a lot of players um, just develop and um, just their talent just goes through the roof by just getting into a new program alone. And what, and, and there also, I feel I, I always use Florida State as an example because it's just been mm -hmm. that for me. But when we, when we brought in DJ Uangole, he's a, he's a fifth year player. You bring in a transfer like that, he may not have another season to go after exactly. a down season. So how do like how does that like picking your poison with transfers depending on what stage of their career is? Yeah, DJ is is kind of hard. Uh like you said fifth year and then it's just kind of hard cuz he bounced from team to team like uh it, it is kind of hard to evaluate some players like that because like as you know like he's a big name out of high school, a uh, big name at Clemson. Um it's just it's just really hard to um, kind of, I don't know, that's just kind of a hard question, like just with fifth-year players because I'm a fifth-year player myself, so it's kind of almost hit or miss with some some athletes and some guys. Because it is, you only got one chance, especially when you're in exactly. that stage, unless you get injured, so mm -hmm. that you don't highly have much room to really, I guess, grow in a program. Because one season's not really a long time, and when you've got a whole no, four-year exactly. career, and you've got so much time to just build, you know, the chemistry we've kind of talked about. But it's definitely interesting to see how college football has went. I mean, transfer portal just it just feels like free agency. I mean, I can't, it's so hard oh, to keep really? track of all these people. Like, I don't 
I'm like, oh, this guy plays here. Like, oh, this guy went here. I'm like, I didn't know he went here. I was like, he who's at this place last year. I'm just like, my head's spinning. Like you said, we were like free agency. That was really how I feel. So especially with the NIL deals, like guys are trying to get paid now. And I do think NIL is really good for for athletes and players, but it does turn into a market. Yeah, it turns into a market. Yeah, definitely. Because it's like, who's the highest bidder now? That's how it kind of works. Uh, I feel like, but we'll uh we'll move on from uh that. We'll, we'll let's do quick before we get into uh everything with your career going on right now. Who you got winning the Heisman Trophy? It's so hard for me, but I I really want to see Travis Hunter win it. Even though I love Gen Z, that's uh, mine. That's my the pick stuff too. that yeah the things he's Gen Z's doing is unreal. I just kind of wish they was both two separate years, but. I think Travis Hunter might just win it because I used literally consistent being super consistent while playing both sides. And like as a college player myself, it's already sometimes hard enough to study and just be one dimensional type of player, but to play both sides, the amount of study film study you have to do, the amount of plays you have to memorize and the amount of like opportunities you have to make out of those just, insane especially keeping your body like running and going and performing at a high level so I think it's just real impressive what Travis Hunter is doing right now and just it's kind of hard not to give it to him when he's getting interceptions and he's scoring touchdowns like but it's kind of yeah. hard for Argenti too he's literally scoring like a lot of times like so many times when he touches the ball so I mean dude he had he five six touchdowns his first game this year Exactly, like, you like, literally have to put seven in a box. Like, you just almost unheard of me still gaining yards. So, it's kind of hard. And he's standing there with that, uh, you've seen that that stance, he just, his knees just aren't even bent. Off, so on. Exactly. I mean, come on. Like, that's nuts. <laughs> I've never seen a running back do that. That's so nuts. <laughs> I, I agree with you, though. I think Travis Hunter should get it. Dude, he's averaging, like, 114 snaps a game. Per game, that's unheard of. That's unheard of. Like, I mean, you have to. You have to. He would never seen a player like this guy. Never. We've never seen him. Even Charles Woodson didn't even play this much offense. And that's where I think he should get it because he's doing something that not even two way players in the past have done. So this is extremely impressive. Like. The, the caliber of how he's playing and then the plays he's making while taking that many snaps, like you said, over 100 a game is so insane. Like we've never, we've ne- literally never seen that. So he has to get it. And th- the question I feel like exactly. there is with Travis Hunter is like, can he translate it to the next level, playing both sides of the ball that consistent? That's where I don't know. Like, I th- truly don't know if he's going to play both sides in the next level. I just, the NFL is just a whole different different environment, and it's so even more taxing on your body. There's a lot less missed tackles. Um, there's a lot of season guys to take great angles. We really study film. A lot of great receivers were, like, if you're not locked in on one position, you could possibly get beat out at both. So, I know he's a one-on-one athlete, but or one in a million athlete, but like I said, it's just kind of I don't know. I want to hear y'all thoughts on if he'll play both sides. Um, I mean, I'd like to see him try it. Me too. I like to see him try it. Well. <laughs> if he tried it, at least like at least give him one season to go out there and exactly. try to play full time on both sides of the ball because we've just never seen it at the NFL level. Like, I mean, we've seen guys play both sides of the ball, you know, once in a while. I mean, we've seen Deion Sanders do it. But we've never seen a guy just go out there every snap and be consistent in the game plan on offense and defense. I just want to see if he's actually capable. And if he's capable of doing it, I mean, shoot, he could he could win MVP as a rookie. Like, I mean, if he can do that, just because nobody's having that amount of production, you can't match it. Exactly. The amount of production he has is insane. Yeah, it's just it, – it's pretty, it's pretty wild that how it kind of – has transformed because I feel like after he's gone, maybe more players will want to play two sides. I mean, maybe he'll start that evolution. Exactly. Yeah. And then definitely, I think they got another two-way player on the team as well. Like, 
So they've got a couple. Roll in another one. Yeah. They've got a couple. And I don't know if you saw, but uh, Colorado got a five star uh, quarterback today. He's like the I number did two guy. See that post. Jeez. That's that's nuts. I I thought Dion was going to go to the NFL, but he's he's staying in Colorado. I'm kind of happy he's staying in Colorado, though. I don't think there's a need for him to leave. He just built that program up so much, and it, oh, so and much. Travis Hunter makes the playoff, then he's got to get the Heisman. He has to, because they can he get can in. Make it in? No, they can. I think they definitely they can. Are. The Big Twelve is pretty wide open, in my opinion. Exactly. I mean, the only team I feel like they have to beat is BYU. But, yeah. And BYU just lost to Kansas last week. So they're kind of looking yeah. like they're not as good as they were early in the season. I think Colorado's clicking and they're hot at the right time. And like Shador Sanders, I mean, he gets all the criticism, but, and I've been one of those people, but he just is making the right throws and he's making every throw. Like you can't, and, and then Travis Hunter and him, I mean, they have amazing connection. And then he's had Terrell Owens, helping him on the sideline every year as a mentor. I mean, that's been huge bringing him in, I think. It kind of reminds me of that. Yeah, almost definitely. (laughs) They can definitely win out. Yeah, they can. They can. I mean, their schedule's very favorable. I mean, they've only – the toughest loss they had was the Kansas State. But, I mean, they they came in – I think the moment that everybody started to wake up is when they went to UCF. And they just drop the exactly. hammer on them. Exactly. Because UCF was, was supposed to be one of the favorites in the Big 12, like at least contending. And no one thought Colorado mm-hmm. was going to be as good. And now they're they're coming out of here. And Dion's getting a good recruiting class this year, just changing everything about that program. It's nuts. No, it's only going to grow. It's only going to grow more and more. And I know you yeah. probably heard about uh, Dion not coming to Florida State because they didn't hire him. That was kind of yeah. I mean, that was, kind of bad. That was terrible. Not I don't. I don't know bad. what they're doing. I don't. First of all, I don't even know what Florida State's plan is moving forward. I mean, I've never seen. I've been a Florida State fan my whole life, my entire life, and I've never mm-hmm. seen this bad of a season. Never. One and nine. We're probably yeah, not even. Nine. We're probably going to finish two and ten. Because no, we're definitely bad. losing to Florida. <laughs> I never seen. I didn't even realize they were one and nine until you just said that. Yeah, one and nine, one to and go nine, from almost undefeated to one and nine is so crazy. Yeah, man. yeah, like uh, it's it's. I almost don't. I don't even have words for it anymore. Exactly. I mean, all I've gotten so used to losing this year with that with that, and it's just hard. To, it's hard to watch too because. I mean, you know, the players aren't going out there and purposely losing. So, like, no, they, they obviously want to win. But we'll uh, we'll go ahead and move on um, to uh, your career. You're at Gardner Webb now. You were at Western Michigan. So let's talk about what was the decision process to transfer from Gar- to Gardner Webb from Western Michigan. So um, I stayed at Western Michigan for four years. Uh, my first two years, I was it was a lot of special teams. Um, you're still developing, but I was the kind of player where I was like a Swiss Army life. So they literally used me at every position from Sam, Will, and Mike. So uh, it was kind of encouraging to see them trust me with that. But um, one thing I was, I was behind a, a couple of NFL linebackers. So I got the opportunity to really learn a lot behind them. And then um, last year in my junior year, got the opportunity to play a lot more linebackers. So like last year, um, I got to play against Iowa, Mississippi State, um, Ohio against um, the current IU quarterback, like I told you earlier. So um, it was kind of real good. But the thing that kind of was conflict was just kind of like my I had, it was real rough for me and my D coordinator. Uh, sometimes he would uh, full blown trust me and then play me a lot. And then other times it's kind of like you'd be hesitant. And once I finally started getting in the game, he started playing me, like, his whole attitude and demeanor started to change about me. Uh, he became, like, extremely confident in me. And it was kind of weird because he recruited me, so I don't know why you wouldn't play a player you recruited in the first place. But And then be surprised when they do well when they're in. So um, just that. And then my D coordinator, he ends up 
becoming the D-line coach at Michigan. And my head coach ends up getting fired. And right now he's an offensive coordinator at Iowa. So those two coaching changes um, kind of just led me just to enter the transfer portal and just try to get a fresh new start, just kind of believing in myself and taking a big step. And I know it's, it's kind of sometimes it's hard in the transfer portal not knowing what you're going to get, but I kind of trusted the player I was, uh, trusted knowledge and the character I had, and just knowing that I did good at Western Michigan. So a lot of the coaches there were vouching for me. It, they did kind of hurt losing me. So um, it was just kind of – it was a good experience. I met a lot of good guys. Like I said, I played with a lot of NFL players there. That's one of the main reasons that I committed there. Uh, so I just was a, got the opportunity to learn a lot, um, play behind a lot of good guys, and then um, take my talents to where I'm at now and just kind of bring some of my skill and some of the culture that came with me to this new school and just kind of be the veteran, be the, be the veteran guy. So. And what was, like, you talked about, like the coaches and things like that. And then entering the transfer portal, mm -hmm. like how did, cause you said he didn't, he didn't trust you and he did like, how, how did you, like, when did that whole thing start between like, there was a specific game or a specific practice where it kind of just triggered. Uh, so it was kind of like my full class recruiting class. So as you know, like you and me are class of 2020. So our recruiting class, he kind of had, just I don't know if it was a grudge against my full, whole class, but he played me and like two other guys for own defense out of my whole class, and a lot of those guys end up having to transfer. But it just kind of like, um, where like a younger guy like me, like I'll make one mistake during practice, it'd be extremely hard, or he'll hold that against you for days. But an older guy would make the same mistake, and it's almost like, oh, it's okay, like you're human, like uh, I'm just next play. So really kind of starts to make you into a robotic type player where to where like you're not trying to mess up you're trying to and it do takes the joy out of it right. i'm sure of right yeah it takes the joy out of it and then it also makes you play robotic and it doesn't allow you to play free and once you don't not allow to play free you start worrying about you making mistakes rather than making a play so it kind of puts you in a, a prisoner mindset to where like if i if i may mess up i know he's about to take me out um, or I know he's about to badmouth you rather than you just saying, let me just play me. Let me be the same player I've always been. Let me just go out and make some plays. So um, it was definitely kind of like over the years, like as you've seen, I just don't make mistakes. I was playing multiple positions. I had to have a deep conversation with him, just kind of asking him, like kind of contradicting for you to have me playing three positions. But kind of hard for you to play me in the game and so um obviously once I got my opportunity I got the opportunity to start in some games so I obviously was making some plays and then you could just see how kind of their attitude changed and then it also just opens me up as a player to where like I didn't care if I made a mistake because I just know that's going to happen like you're not going to make every right. single there's tackle. no such thing as perfection it's impossible exactly. like you're gonna exactly. you're gonna mess up at some point and I, yeah mm -hmm. I've uh, that seems to be a, a pretty big theme with depending on where you're at. Some coaches are a little bit more strict on mistakes. Some aren't, but uh, I mean, that's, that's a part of it. And defenses are going to get scored on. I mean, you guys don't want that to happen, but it exactly. almost happens every game. So like someone's going to mess up and it's, I feel like it's okay to do that. And uh, yeah, that's, you don't want the, when the game starts to not become fun, that's just when you start to becoming unengaged. You, you, you're not, you don't really care about exactly. what you're trying to do it's on the field. Like right. Exactly. And it shouldn't, I mean, it is a job, but like, it shouldn't but yeah, feel like it that. It's still football. Like I still a game I love when I was young. Right. And, and it also messes with the player mentally on top of when you have stuff going on outside of football. So you just feel like the whole world against you sometimes. And for some athletes, it's really hard to break out of, including myself, like, it really is a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of pressure on you as a man and as a brother and as a son. Like, at the end of the day, you still have a family you're trying to make them proud. And um, they, your family might not know exactly what's going on, like the full details of how it is to be a college football player or, or a college athlete. And also, you know, 
I think these coaches sometimes don't realize how much impact they can have on the athlete's mental health and also just the way they love the game they started playing when they were young. Right. I mean, it all starts because you're a little kid and you you see a ball and you just want to, exactly. you know, have fun. Go play. Yeah. <laughs> it's It starts pretty simple, but w- when you came to Gardner-Webb, what was your expectations going in? Uh, I just knew it was going to be open expectations. Obviously, like, there was so many new players that came in on top of with a head coach, so it was a real risk to take just putting my trust in a full new coach and um, also just new players. So um, as I could see the talent around me, it was not like I expected us to lose, but um, I had very high hopes. Uh, Obviously, I know I was a big part of the team, so it's really like this is stuff I can control. Like I can control the destiny of the team, even though it was 22 players um, or 11 on defense, 11 on offense that can control the game. But just trying to know you can influence 22 players that play on offense and defense that um, you, know, you can really kind of stray to control the destiny of the team based on your mentality and your own leadership. So kind of came in there with good expectations. Um, it hasn't all been good. Like, you know, there's pros and cons to every school, every situation. But for the most part, I have really good expectations coming to the school. And how did uh, them winning back-to-back conference championships affect your decision to go there? Um, once I heard that, it was kind of very impressive to me. It did kind of help me when I'm going to come here, even though it's like, it wasn't my team that went back-to-back, but it's kind of good coming to a win and culture. Our head coach, he came from a Division two school, uh, Tiffin, where um, they went undefeated back-to-back. So. Uh, it made it kind of more comfortable coming with a winning coach uh, who had a coach here winning at his old program. And I kind of know, like, obviously, this is first head coach a job at an FBS program, I mean, FCS Division One. So, um, obviously, you can't run it exactly the same. The competition is going to be a little bit better. So, I know it wasn't going to be, like, undefeated or anything, but um, it kind of makes you a little more comfortable coming with a coach who's used to winning. Yeah, that, that that definitely does help because you want to come in and contribute to that winning. And but I mean, you guys have had a pretty up and down season. You, I think you got what you guys lose three games in a row to start out, and then yeah. you guys won a couple, and then you went on another losing streak. Like, exactly. how has it been dealing with those ups and downs? Uh, this has kind of been a struggle because because like like you said, the first three games were so close, and we've never had an FBS win in program history into. Come like that close, like literally six points from beating JMU, uh, about maybe even three or two points from beating Charlotte, and we were dominating them the entire game, like right. literally the entire game. And then our first game losing by literally one point, um, it, it literally like those three wins right there, like a, uh, like literally spring us into the playoffs or change the trajectory of the school and the whole season. So, um, just kind of knowing that, and then. Um, just kind of reinforcing that we are a talented team throughout the season. Like you've seen these close games, you've seen some of the games we were supposed to win. Just kind of bouncing from those losses, just reminding your team of the talent they had. Yeah, I, that was, and I did, I did go back and watch that JMU game. And defensively, I mean, you guys mm-hmm. had them on lock for the whole first half. And then pretty much for majority of the third quarter, and then all of a sudden it kind of just slipped away. I mean, how 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 challenging or how right. frustrating is that? Oh well, it was very frustrating. We were going for it a lot on fourth down, and then we were getting a lot of stops on defense, like you like you have noticed. It is kind of frustrating. Obviously, I know it's never to point of fingers or blame anything, but uh, we just needed like one more touchdown or couple more field goals to win and just not being able to get those extra points uh really just told the difference in the game so that's right. what really was frustrating right uh, that's that's tough and th- that was your second game of the season so it's very exactly. early and like you said that could have changed the whole trajectory of the season but still you still got your games to go you play you're playing western illinois on saturday mm-hmm. 
what is yeah. the game plan on defense and what you're trying to limit Western Illinois on? So uh, they're a very explosive offense. Uh, they have about 500 all-purpose yards in a couple of games, in like one or two games. So um, just taking pride in knowing that my team defensively is very good. Just going against a, um, a very good offense just makes it a little more exciting. And then just lets us know that uh, we have to be our, on our A game because this is an explosive offense. And coming from down south, a lot of these guys – uh, might not be used to playing in the cold weather. So we got to make sure they're ready for that. And then um, just make sure offensively we're able to score the ball because uh, Western Illinois, they struggle a lot on defense, like big weakness on their team. So as long as we keep them off the board as much as we can and we just capitalize offense, I don't, I don't see this as a game we shouldn't dominate and win. And for you specifically, like what's what's your what's your goal? Like, are you going to be trying to rush the passer or playing coverage? Are you doing a little bit of both? I'm doing a lot of a little bit of both, and I'm playing a little bit of Mike. So, um, our our defense is very aggressive, real downhill. So, I'm just trying to make sure I'm able to shoot gaps, uh, free my defensive linemen so they can make a play and get them off double teams. Um. Uh, make the plays when they come to me and also just do my job and win on the edge when it's time for me to blitz. So that's really my goal, just make the plays when they come to me and win my one-on-one battles. Let's go. What's one, uh, what's one word or give me, give me three words that describe you as a linebacker. I say speed coverage and, um, I say flow, just because I once I get a good feeling in the flow of the game, it's almost like you in tune with yourself. And once I get the play recognition, it's it's like my body is able to move on its own and just uh, really shoot downhill and, and make the plays when they come. So that's kind of how it was last game for me. Just um, I I feel like I had a really good closing speed. Uh, I feel like I got real good coverage. I haven't been on a lot of coverage this year as I've been playing Mike, but my years at Western Michigan are playing in space at like a, a star or nickel. Uh, obviously, I've guarded the best of the best type of receivers, so I've always been confident in my coverage. So just using my closing speed and my athleticism, I feel like those have been my biggest strong suits. You definitely don't struggle with speed. That's for sure. Yeah, Whenever I watch you, you're, you're definitely running across the field. When you when you what 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 inspired you to play linebacker out of all the positions you could play on defense? So eventually, when I started playing football as a quarterback, I used to love offense. Mm. I loved offense so much, and then Cathedral ended up putting me at linebacker randomly, and just my <laughs> hunger, exactly my hunger of getting on the field, I just kind of accepted it, and um, just I'm I'm the oldest out of nine nine siblings, so. I was really just trying to set the tone, get into college any way I could. And football is something that I loved that I didn't even real, realize I could get a full ride scholarship with. So um, just trying to get on the field any way I could, I ended up at linebacker. The Cathedral actually used me at corner. I played corner at Cathedral, uh, played a little bit of uh, outside linebacker, played a little bit of stand up in, and I played just a little bit of safety. But through my recruiting, uh, like IU actually had put me at safety during my camps and visits. So uh, I could have ended up a safety. So it was would be a pretty big safety wherever I could. <laughs> exactly. But I wish I really would have learned safety and stuck it out. But I just think, you know, high school, a lot of people undersized. So in high school, I'm a lot bigger. But, you know, at Khadija, like we only ran one safety, which was Shiloh. But we had two safeties yeah. and some and a couple more bigger guys. I could have been at safety right with them. So it could have been real interesting. Jeez. Yeah, that yeah, it could have been real. You, you would have been exactly. uh, you would have been an absolute Frank train no, for, for the real. safety position because guys are usually not exactly. that big. Man. But now I'm seeing like I got the speed and I could I could possibly play safety now. So I still do play in a lot of space when we got like third downs and stuff. So they use me in space. Uh, when they can. It seems like that safety position is lingering in your head. Have you thought about yeah. making that change still? 
No, nah, not because – well, really because I'm literally like the perfect size now for linebacker, and I'm able to move with good speed. And um, as you see now, like uh, the game has changed it where you need a lot of speedy linebackers, linebackers yeah. who are able to cover with these Tyree Kill type of players and uh, shifty slots. Like you don't need the big, fat, barely linebackers no more. So no. kind of like wherever the team needs me, I'm willing to play. No, it's kind of you see guys like Micah Parsons who can do everything, like you said. Like you're you're exactly. going in coverage, you're rushing the passer. I mean, there's not just one thing that you're stuck to doing. Exactly. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I want to ask you going back to your game against Tennessee Tech, September mm-hmm. 29th. Power was out, and there the no hurricane. Was that the was that the power outage? There was no was, power on in yeah. the game at all. So like, like I, was, I saw that, I was like. That was because of Hurricane Helene, yep. I'm pretty sure. So like it hit us bad. It, bad. I'm in Florida, so we were we were kind of away. Mm-hmm. We, I was in Orlando, so we were away from it, but we got um, Milton, which was pretty bad. But how was that with just the like obviously playing without no power? It was a day game, mm-hmm. so it wasn't really affecting you. But how weird was that not to have a scoreboard and not to have sound effects and music and things like that? I was, like, extremely crazy. Like, it didn't even feel like you were supposed to be playing the game anymore because, like, literally the night before, like, a lot of us had nothing to eat. Uh, Like, I literally ate, like, so I was basically, like, eating family dollar before the game because there's no power <laughs> anywhere in, like, the, the next 10, 15 miles, like, just trying to find somewhere to eat. Um, A lot of my teammates were just in, in a hot room with nothing, like, no power, no nothing, so. I kind of – there's no excuse, but they obviously have a slight advantage over us, like, that game, like, just because, like, we literally had zero power. And then the first quarter went by so fast because there's no commercial breaks. Um, you couldn't see the clock at all. You couldn't see the score at all. You had no idea what the score was. And then it was just literally, like, like, literally, like, you just woke up and played, like, it was just backyard football. <laughs> That's wild. And I saw, I saw that and I, yeah, I knew you guys were affected up there. I mean, I saw the pictures and everyone, everyone did. Did you guys do anything to help out the community during that time? Um, so the way it happened was so like, so spontaneous, like it literally happened. Like we woke up in the morning, it was storming so bad. We really couldn't really go outside to really help anybody or anything. Um, they kind of told everybody to stay in our rooms for the most part. And then, um, it was really kind of hard to help people or get help yourself in general because there's no cellular service anywhere. So it was extremely hard for me to be able to talk to my family. Um, like we're in the middle of North Carolina. We're about 50 minutes from Charlotte, North Carolina. So uh, we kind of in the country just a little bit. So it was really kind of hard to even get to a big city because the GPS wasn't working because you lost cellular service. So Right. Um, it was really kind of hard to help yourself out, let alone help others. So, yeah, I saw that, was, and I was like, "That's yeah. pretty crazy." To it crazy. so it happened like literally before, like right before the game. That's when all that. It's no, like... it, it literally happened. So Friday, I'm getting up. Uh, I was just saw, they, I had a big test I had to do. I was praying to God I didn't have to take the exam, and so I get up <laughs> at like eight eight a.m. Um, what ends up happening is uh, basically like my power goes out about like 8 a.m. or so and um, what ends up happening is the power goes out it comes back on in about like 15 minutes and then um, after that it goes right back out and then that's when they send us an email like all classes are canceled because the power will not come back on so this was Friday, the day before the game. And, uh, literally after that, they were trying to see and trying to find out if the game's going to be canceled. And they ended up still, obviously, as you know, continuing to play the game. But that entire Friday was just no power, no nothing. Like, people were literally trying to fight to figure out, like, what they're going to eat, uh, like, if we're still going to play, uh, how to get into contact with their families and everything. So... It was just very crazy, and then we the game was like two o'clock p.m. So it literally felt like we just woke up, had to go right straight to the stadium, and just praying the power would cut back on. How was the attendance for that game? 
uh, the attendance was it was pretty decent. I mean, it was nothing else to do, like besides go to the football game. So uh, it was pretty pretty mild crowd, but it just sucked that we lost the way we did. Yeah, that, so it was kind of crazy game. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of an unusual circumstance, and honestly, the hurricane was so far. I, I was I was shocked that it even went all the way up to North Carolina. I mean, it it was. Exactly. I mean, that was wild to see. Was it like flooding, like in your about. area and stuff like that, or was it just power outage? So we kind of got lucky, but the wind was extremely bad. Um, there was so many trees on campus, like torn to shreds, like looked like a tornado that went straight through. And then um, we're I'm about like 30, 40 minutes from um, huge mountains. So if you could look up like Asheville, North Carolina, you could see like literally highways are destroyed, like ripped apart, like ripped out the ground. Like looks like a, a earthquake hit. That's how bad it was. So it was literally on my route back to Indiana that they said it's going to take so long to uh, um, repair and fix. Uh, uh, so like, we didn't have to go through no uh, flooding, but it was just so extreme and so crazy to see that, like you said, they're literally a Western North Carolina instead of Eastern North Carolina. So I was so confused that I could even get hit by a hurricane in this part of North Carolina. Like Me too. So Me too. And I'm literally in the mm -hmm. hub where it's like, you get hit by hurricanes all the time and we're pretty used to it exactly. down in Florida, but yeah. like up there, I, I was like, huh? They got That's hit. the last place you're expecting. Yeah. Yeah. It was the last place I, I was expecting. Golly. That, yeah. I saw That's that. Weird. I saw that story. I saw like somebody do a report on it and I was like, wait, they didn't have power? No, so no power. What, the like, entire what, game. I was like, what the heck? Like, I was like, how did this like work? But I was surprised you even played the game at that point. I mean, I, I'm surprised they didn't cancel it because the locker rooms were probably hot. You couldn't take no, showers so after the game. <laughs> couldn't take no shower like i have to forcibly take a shower in extremely cold water like in the pitch black darkness trying to hurry up take a shower like, well you know what it's like to be in a hurricane because down here i've literally had i've been at the point where i've had to take all my food out of my fridge put it in a cooler and literally cook cool. on a grill like charcoal grill for like a full Whatever week it takes. like two full years week, ago for two two years ago for hurricane ian Literally, we didn't have power for like a week. And then Fort Myers didn't have power for like maybe two or three weeks mm -hmm. around there. But I mean, we went up there and it was worse than when I was at. I was like, that's insane. Man. I know. That's and then the, we, we, we got hurt by th we hit, we got hit by two in like span of like a week and a half. Yeah, that was the craziest part. And it just. You got to really pray for some of the families that go through that. And like yourself, like you had to literally put everything in the cooler. And I left for the, for yeah, Milton. Yeah. I left you Orlando. I said, screw to. this. I am not staying here. No way. And like my grandpa, he's been in Orlando for pretty much like almost half my life. So he's like, yeah, we're staying. Like we're staying. Like, I'm like you just a seasoned veteran or something. Cause there's no uh, way. I don't know. A seasoned veteran or not. I was looking <laughs> At exactly. my, I was looking at the wind, like how how bad the wind was gonna be, and at my apartment, it said mm. the exact area where I was gonna be, 110 miles an hour. I'm like, I'm out. Yeah, it's out. Yeah, it's <laughs> especially with the flooding too. Like, the flooding is the worst part. The like, flooding wasn't that here. bad here because we were more inland. It was just more mm. so the wind. But like, yeah. Tampa got absolutely like they could like the did you see Raymond James Stadium how much no, water was going in yeah. there one of and my teammates the, from Tampa, they showed me yeah like that's crazy and they had to move it was so bad like Tropicana Field where the Rays play they're not even playing in that stadium next year not, like yeah. at all they're going and playing in the spring training stadium <laughs> where the Yankees play for spring training the whole season because that stadium's not even going to be ready yet it's not not at all like like it's pretty insane. So insane, yeah. But, I mean, you just got to not another one hit either. I mean, like I've never seen that. Me either. Like that's so that's so insane. And where it like where it formed was the weird part, because like it was like right on the coast of like Mexico, like the east co the west coast of Mexico, or no, it was the east coast of Mexico. But it came like all the way across the Gulf, and then I was like, "What is going on?" Like I heard about it like. Yeah. 
a week ago and they were like, yeah, we were going to get another hurricane. And then the, the, the week after that hurricane came, all these weather people are going like, Hey, like, you know, there's another one that's about to come next week. I'm like, stop. Another just one is stop. Next week. It's so crazy. Yeah. Which nothing came, but I was like, just like, stop it, please. Like we don't need three. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nuts, dude. It was nuts, but I'm glad everything went okay for you guys up there. Yeah. Cause that's a pretty crazy situation. You probably never experienced anything like that before. Never. And let alone playing a game with no power. Like no music, you're you're used to the commercials. Like, what, okay, so since there's no commercials, because when you're at a college football game, I mean, there's a lot of like media timeouts and things like that. Like, how does that change the game plan per se? That's when I went to one to like let you know, like the game went so fast. When I tell you, like, it literally felt shorter than a high school game. That's how fast it was. Like. That was just uh, like when they told us they just blew the whistle for the first quarter. I'm like, that was the first quarter. Like, I'll tell you, went by for like five minutes because it was nonstop, no commercial, no nothing. Like, literally just playing football, like you back in like Pee Wee or something. And there's nobody really, no commercials, no sponsors, no nothing. Like, you just rolling. And you usually, with the media timeouts, you get extra time to talk to your coaches and things like that. Exactly. But then it was like, we just playing. And then they basically, they had the momentum, and like you said, we went through the hurricane. It's like they just stayed with the momentum because there really wasn't no breaks. No, the the quarter stops were in short. Like everything was short that game. So that's that's crazy. But before before I get you out of here, I've got two questions for you. One, sure. I know it's kind of hard to look after after the season, but what are your what are your goals after this season, and what are your plans going forward? So, uh, as far as like school and wise, and then like if I was to get into a regular job, uh, right now, like I'm studying clinical psychology. So, I like to probably get into like clinical therapy. And uh, what I'm really aiming towards is like real estate. I'm trying to get my real estate license. Uh, that's something I really want to get heavily invested in is just real estate. And just I might end up going to Florida, trying to move to Florida or like Arizona or um, Texas. And then, um, other than that, I might try to give a shot of like the combine, uh, um, just the pro day, to see where it could take me. Because it's almost like, why well, not? Might as well. You only get one chance. So, so your eligibility is yeah. you're done. At, your eligibility, you don't have any more after this year. So I got to talk to like our compliance because it's been real kind of uh, weird coming in and COVID just for eligibility. So I'm still trying to finalize that out. But if this is my last year, then. That was pretty much like my intention is just trying to get into like um, set myself up for like regular life and then just trying to start a career like you, like just something you're interested in, like not something like your parents wanted to lead you in or something you feel like you're doing to make your parents proud. This is really something you your own self enjoys and that you really strive to do yourself. So after this season, how how do you think? Like you're going to try to keep football alive, obviously, but how do you think it'll feel? Oh, without it football? Gone? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's like you almost program like my whole life since I've been 11 or 12 has been an athlete or a sport. So especially once high school started, it's like you're used to a routine uh, of like getting up to go to practice, getting up to work out. And uh, I'm blessed enough to be in shape, but I just want to see how much motivation I'll have to really go work out after this. Like, I know I'm going to still keep myself in shape and stuff, but uh, when it's like not somebody telling you, you got to be here at this specific time, uh, it's going to feel a lot different. It's going to feel like a lot of the times when I go home for like winter break or I have like two weeks for the summer, sometimes I feel like, like a bum or like I haven't been productive by not playing a sport. Like um, it just kind of feels like a sport feels like my job or, or my calling. So I feel like once I get to that point, it's going to feel kind of weird just kind of figuring out what to do with so much time on my hands where there's no consequence for like sleeping in or you know, there's no consequence for like, uh, like basically just doing what you want during the day and like, 
I know you kind of experienced it too, just kind of like what to do with all your free time. Yeah. So it was kind of. Has coaching ever came up management. for you? Have you ever thought about coaching football, staying around the game? I don't know if I want to be a, I don't know if I want to be a coach yet. I said I might coach if my son, I have a son and he ends up playing. He might take me to coaching, but I see there's a lot of big, big money with coaching, but I just also see the amount of time they have to be there. Like a lot of my coaches don't get to see their wives or their children. Um, they're literally there from 6 a.m. to like 8 p.m. every day or 7 p.m. every day. And I'm like, yeah, the money might be good, but it just might not be something I'd like to do yet. Yeah. It kind of like, I'm going to go with the flow. And if I end up getting called to coach, I probably won't stray from it because I'm just, I like helping a lot of the kids and helping a lot of uh, people develop, even like my own younger teammates. Like, I like coaching them up and getting them right and just giving them knowledge that I, I didn't get the opportunity to get it right away. And hey, I don't know if you knew this before I get you out of here. You for your time at Western Michigan, your the, your whole entire playing career there, you have the exact same stats as you do this year. The exact same. For those Are you serious? No, that's I'm crazy. so serious. I was really looking. I was jotting down your stats and I'm like, what? He's got 21 tackles this year and he that, he that he had that and literally the exact same. Like you can go do the math. Oh, cool. It's yeah, the exact same stats. stats. I'll put them on the screen for everyone to see it. They're the exact same. I'll yeah. even add it up. <laughs> I, see. I was like, that's, wow. That's so crazy. And then I still got another another game to play, but it just show you like I'm pretty sure like most of those came from like last year where my coach really started putting a lot of trust in me. But like, it's just shocking. Like it's no surprise when a player does good when you give them the opportunity and you could also give them the opportunity to fail or move on or to succeed and move on. So um, that's kind of crazy even found that out and that I have that now. So now <laughs> i got to just go out next game and kind of – Well, they're not going to be the same after next game. <laughs> make as many plays as I can. No, it's not, it's not, not at all. So I, just no. kinda, I really appreciate you for bringing up that statistic and just let me know because – I got a different type of goal this game. Try to break that little season. But that's so crazy. It felt like I made so many tackles. I don't know they probably didn't give me all of them that I made there, but that's just crazy. I've already met the whole career at Western I've already done here. Exact. So. And it's exact same. Like, I'm talking like you exact copy same. and paste the number. It's exact same. Exact same. No, exact I same. I, my mind was blown. I was like looking. I'm like, yeah, What? <laughs> this is gonna be the craziest no, thing so I've crazy. ever seen. <laughs> but, I'm pretty sure I beat sacks though. Yeah. Hey, get 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 some. I want to see. I want to see some sacks next game. Yeah, yeah. I got hit you. hit I'm the quarter because you have a more. couple quarterback hits, so like you're yeah, getting exactly. pressure. Uh -huh. I've seen that. You obviously got the yeah. speed. You're strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw it in high school. I mean, I knew you were gonna play in college. I mean, it was it was yeah. a no brainer. Seeing you make the play, you just were making plays that no high school player was making at the time. So I'm like, okay, well he's gonna he's gonna play in college. Like there's no there's no doubt about that. And when you come from a place like Cathedral, where like exactly. literally all they do is Standard. eat, breathe, and sleep football, I mean, you're you know, gonna go, you're gonna be fine. I'll take pride at Cathedral, and it's actually surprising. Like once you get to, um, like once you get to college, a lot of people are familiar with Cathedral. So that's kind of dope coming from there and just knowing like. How many people they put out this division one like every single year yeah, right now they crazy. on a little bit of slump i haven't really been following their football program yeah, since i've graduated because i know they didn't they win state when you left or yeah, literally, yeah, wasn't that kind of bittersweet to see them win state when you guys literally had so many chances right to after. do it right after yeah that's so crazy <laughs> but this like the first season i've seen where they like have like three losses more than three or something so I'm like, dang, that's kind of crazy. Like, wonder what they got going on. But I haven't really kept up with it too much. I, mean, I know the basketball team's still killing it, but mm -hmm. I know they've been doing their thing. But man, well, I think this is gonna go ahead and do it uh, for today's edition of the the Take Podcast. Yes, um, I appreciate you uh, hopping on, dude. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, I appreciate you, brother. It's really good <laughs> catching up and. I just really appreciate you because this is kind of like my first little podcast. So 
just kind of going through it with you and just uh, getting through like all the questions and just kind of going through those just made me feel real comfortable and felt like a really good conversation. Yes, absolutely. That's the goal. We like, we like having okay. conversations and I got to get you yeah. out on a take. Who's your national championship yeah. pick? National championship. I grew up an Alabama fan, so I'm going to just say Alabama. But even though I know they kind of hit or miss right now. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. I used to love Alabama. I don't know. Uh, I'm not even going to say it. I, I, yeah. It kinda... Who's your pick? Ohio State. Ohio State. Okay. I've been riding them the whole year. Okay, but Ohio I don't, State. I'm not a big Ohio, I'm not a big Ohio State fan, but I just like their team. I like what they got going on. I don't think anyone's mm-hmm. going to beat them. They've been the most consistent, yeah. in my opinion, from what I've seen. But yeah, that's facts so. though. Yeah, I think it's been. They got to watch out for Oregon though, and they got to watch out for IU this weekend. So you don't see. <laughs> That's going to be a great game, bro. That is going to be a great game. But we'll we'll go ahead and end it. This is uh, Quentin Cannon, yeah. linebacker, playing at Gardner-Webb University. Uh, check him out uh, this weekend. Is it games at 3 o'clock yeah. against Western Illinois? So do you know well, what? Uh, I didn't see what network it was on. Central time. I think it's on it's ESPN+. Probably Plus. Be ESPN too. Or ESPN+, Plus or ESPN2, one of the two. Yeah, check yeah. him out on ESPN+, Plus yeah. this Saturday. I'm going to be watching. I'll have the the whole double screens on with all these games on Saturday. So I'm definitely going to tune in, but I appreciate you hopping on. This has been another episode of the take. I'm your host, Jackson Burleson, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.